I want to welcome you to this lecture in the State of Democracy lecture series. I'm Grant Reher. I'm the director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, which is the institute that coordinates the series. Um, first, on behalf of Syracuse University and the Maxwell School, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, uh, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands we now sit. Uh, my Campbell Institute colleague, Elizabeth Cohen, will have more to say about Professor Stephen Macedo in a minute. I just want to say it's a very personal pleasure for me to be welcoming our former colleague back to campus. Um, after all these years, we still miss him very much. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And I'm also looking forward to hearing uh, from my colleagues, Tom Keck and Lawrence Thomas, who will be offering brief responses. I want to thank Elizabeth Cohen uh, for, for thinking of Steve in this time and for this series and for arranging uh, the invitation to him. I also want to thank the Dean's Office for supporting the series and for technical support, the Information and Computing Technology Group, in particular, Tom Fazio. And thanks as well and as always to Kelly Coleman, who works in the Campbell Institute and who helps put together these events. Uh, before I turn it over to Elizabeth, I want to just make uh, uh, three reminders. First, if you haven't already done so, please silence your cell phones or other devices that make noises. And second, I want to ask you when we get to the audience uh, question and answer period, which is, is the last part of the event, uh, and this event will follow the two faculty responses to Steve's remarks, I'd like to ask you to please wait for the microphone that will be uh, passed to you. And I, we ask you that for two reasons. First of all, so that you are part of our archive of the event. And second, we do have folks watching on the live stream. Uh, I know for sure, at least of one that I spoke to earlier today, uh, and so that they can hear what your question is. And then uh, finally, following the talk, we'll have a reception out in the foyer where there will be uh, refreshments and where we can continue the conversation uh, that we begin here. Also, um, Steve will uh, be available to sign a copy of his book for you. It's the most colorful academic book I've ever seen. It's beautiful cover, beautiful design. Um, so let me now turn it over to my Campbell colleague, Elizabeth Cohen. Uh, Elizabeth is a professor in the political science department here at the Maxwell School. Elizabeth, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Grant, and I want to also extend a really uh, hearty thank you to Kelly Coleman, who's been a real hero in the Campbell Institute. She's been doing the job of about three people while we're short-staffed, so thanks so much, Kelly, and also to the Dean's Office for their support of the State of Democracy series. I want to um, wholeheartedly also thank my colleagues and today's respondents to Professor Macedo's lecture. Tom Keck and Lawrence Thomas. It's actually really difficult to give um, a response to a lecture as it's being given, especially when one only has five short minutes. And I'm really grateful to both of you. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. <laughs> Um, and now I want, <laughs> I want to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen Macedo. Um, often people will begin an introduction by saying that the speaker needs no introduction. In this case, it is literally true because many of you knew Steve when he was on the faculty in his capacity as the Michael O. Sawyer Chair of Constitutional Law and Politics, the endowed chair that's now occupied by my colleague, Tom. Um, but not all of you know Professor Macedo personally, and I want to urge you to get to know him. He is one of the most lively, creative, and knowledgeable scholars with whom I have had the pleasure of breaking bread over the years. Um, not all of you know this, but it was Professor Macedo who started the State of Democracy lecture series. I think, was it back in 1994, I was, was it? 95. 95? Yeah. All right, right when I was starting grad school. Um, <laughs> so I, I hope it's gratifying, Steve, to see that the series is um, still running and running in much the same way that, that it was when you started it. I think now more than ever, we can probably all agree that we need institutional traditions like this to bolster and deepen the democratic habit of collective deliberation and reflection. When Professor Macedo arrived here fresh from a teaching stint at Harvard, he was a relatively junior scholar best known for his book, Liberal Virtues, in which he undertook to show how canonical figures in the liberal tradition placed virtue squarely at the center of diverse, tolerant, and free societies. In many ways, this book kicked off a discipline-wide discussion of the importance of virtue in democratic theory. 
For many years, Professor Macedo deepened and advanced this dialogue, writing and editing a series of important books and articles about liberalism, virtue, and democratic politics, defied powerful stereotypes about the cookie cutter, predictable political profile of ivory tower academics. At the same time, he kept one foot planted in the world of constitutional law and its place in debates about matters of concrete political issues. To say that he is highly productive would be an understatement. I not only cannot list all of his important publications, I needed a power bar just to read through the list of them on his CV. But its interest in issues that matter to people's lives is an enduring theme of his work, and that brings us to the reason we have invited Professor Macedo to speak to us today. His most recent book, Just Married, Same-Sex Couples, Monogamy, and the Future of Marriage, contains an incredibly creative, original, and powerful set of arguments about what the legalization of same-sex marriage means for our society. And I'll be honest right now, and I hope Steve doesn't unfriend me for this, but when the book came out, it was right around the Obergefell decision legalizing same-sex marriage, and I was like, ugh. A book, another book about same-sex marriage. How can anyone possibly have anything new to say about this subject? But it was Steve's book, so I knew I had to get it and read it. And I downloaded it before a trip, started reading it when I boarded. And as the trip proceeded, I read, and I realized that I had been really, really wrong, and that the book contains truly fascinating arguments about same-sex marriage and monogamy that I had not ever thought of and certainly had not seen anyone else writing about. Even better, in the book, Professor Macedo manages to blend high theory about important subjects such as equality and social standing with concrete social scientific evidence from societies the world over. It made my trip go quickly, reading the book, which I urge you to purchase, have signed, and also read. It truly deepened my understanding of the role of marriage in liberal societies. And I know that his talk will do the same for you today. Uh, before I turn things over to Steve, just a note on how we will proceed. Um, Steve's going to talk for about 40 minutes. Following his talk, we will have brief remarks from our two discussants. We will hear first from Lawrence Thomas, professor of philosophy and political science. That's what they keep telling me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's true. Uh, then we will hear from uh, Thomas Keck, Michael O. Sawyer, chair of constitutional law and politics. Then I'll take the mic back for a moment and we'll have a Q&A session featuring you guys. So start thinking up your questions while this is all going on so you can be sure to get them in. And I wanna say one additional word. When we talk about things like marriage and sexuality, we inevitably venture into terrain uh, or onto terrain that is controversial. Indeed, there are subjects broached in this book that can make people uncomfortable and that might not qualify for what is colloquially known as polite conversation. And if hearing and talking about such matters makes you uncomfortable and you don't wish to be a part of that, that's totally fine. I have days like that myself. But we do think that creating a space in which people who do wish to delve into this terrain is a vital part of what a university does and what we do at the Maxwell School. And we're extremely fortunate to have Professor Stephen Macedo here to guide us in the endeavor today. So please join me in offering a triumphant welcome home to <laughs> Professor Macedo. Well, thank you. It's a bit loud, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, for that extremely generous, overly generous uh, introduction. Thanks to Kelly for making this all run so smoothly, and thanks to the commentators for, for your time, and thanks for being here. It's nice to be back, see some, some remarkably young old friends. Uh, and uh, I think I remember my job talk was when Eggers Hall was brand new. Uh, it wasn't even finished yet. I remember walking through the building with Bob McClure and how proud he was of it. Uh, and justifiably so, it's a great building. Uh, I taught con law and civil liberties in this room for four years and uh, had a wonderful experience with that. Uh, I met Michael Sawyer uh, and had a very nice lunch with him um, and uh, enjoyed this series quite a lot. So, so I'm really uh, pleased to be back. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the book, which is partly about same-sex marriage. The court moved a bit faster than I expected, but partly about marriage as a civil institution within liberalism uh, and, and partly about monogamy. It's one third roughly on each of those. So let me, uh, let's do this so we can go enjoy the reception. And, uh, <laughs> um, on, on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court made history by holding that the Constitution's guarantees of liberty and equality require that the states must extend the right to marry to two persons of the same sex. And the speed with which that happened seems astonishing, uh, at least to those of us of a certain age, because it was only 30 years ago that a majority of the justices voted to uphold state laws that criminalized sex relations between consent, same sex 
consenting partners in the privacy of the home. And it was only in 2003 that that earlier decision, Bowers versus Hardwick, was overturned by the Supreme Court. And it was only in 2003 that Massachusetts became the first state to recognize uh, a right of same-sex couples to marry. Uh, uh, 13, 12 years after that, and uh, uh, marriage equality became a national right. And one might have thought the marriage revolution was over. But conservatives, such as Justice Antonin Scalia, warned for decades that the most basic rights for gay and lesbian Americans would put us on a slippery slope to legalize polygamy along with, and I quote, adult incest, prostitution, masturbation, adultery, bestiality, and obscenity. Those are the bits that Elizabeth warned you about. <laughs> <laughs> Quoting Justice Scalia, which uh, can be very upsetting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts, in his dissenting opinion in Obergefell, the same-sex marriage case, said, and I quote, a leap from opposite-sex marriage to same-sex marriage is much greater than one from, two, from a two-person union to plural unions, which have deep roots in some cultures around the world, and indeed they do. My colleague Robert George and many conservative scholars and activists continue to warn that in the wake of Obergefell, polyamory, which is the egalitarian form of, of uh, polygamy, and even adult incest are now moral certainties. The logic of liberalism, as ex represented by Justice Kennedy's opinion in Obergefell, compels the further extension of, the, of basic rights to consensual adults, groupings of three or more, otherwise known as thruples or morsums, and also to adult siblings, according to some, or even parents and their adult children who wish to wed. That's according to the conservatives. Now, some will write off this kind of talk as right-wing fear-mongering, but in fact, many scholars and activists on the left have in, in effect embraced most of the slope, and some have embraced all of it. These progressives are, agree that same-sex marriage is an unstable and unprincipled stopping point on the, ro on the road to more radical reform. So Sonu Betty, a professor at Dartmouth, uh, argues that, and I quote, liberal neutrality invalidates both prohibitions on same-sex marriage and marriage itself. Preserving marriage and extending it to gays takes sides, he says, in a very personal decision about what constitutes the good life. It's no more, he says, than natural law, but with a gay spin. The liberal state, he says, should get out of the marriage business by leveling down to a universal status of civil union, neutral as to the gender and the affective purposes of the domestic partnerships. That's actually a quote from Andrew March uh, at Yale. Elizabeth Brake, a philosopher in Arizona, agrees that monogamous civil marriage unfairly favors, as she puts it, amorous dyads and denies recognition to many other caring relationships, including non-sexual friendships and polyamorous unions, again, polyamory being the egalitarian form of polygamy or group marriage. And as I said, some go so far as to argue that categorical prohibitions on adult incest must be lifted, at least where there's no possibility of genetically damaged offspring. Sonu Betty provocatively offers the hypothetical example of two gay brothers who wish to wed. And indeed, the German Ethics Council just last year argued for the decriminalization of adult sibling incest uh, in a case which I can, we can talk about in the discussion, if you wish. Frederick de Boer put it very simply in a widely, widely cited posting on Politico after Obergefell. Consent, he said, is the measure of all things in matters of sexual and romantic practice. So every one of these progressive arguments is, 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 has been broadcast on the, on the political right to warn of impending doom, though it no longer looks so impending now that Obergefell is 18 months old. So in any case, these remarks build on the book that Elizabeth mentioned. My argument is that same-sex marriage, civil marriage as a status relation in law, and monogamy all make sense here and now, given what we know about plural relationships. And I go further and argue that the law of marriage facilitates the availability of a central aspect of the human good, and that monogamy plays an important role in supporting not only equal liberty, but fair opportunity to pursue the great good of married life, making monogamous marriage itself an important aspect of our constitutional order and a bulwark of liberal justice. Now, I'm gonna skip the conservative arguments that I spend a few chapters on in the book because of time. Uh, the, the, so describing the conservative arguments would get me into some of the naughty bits that, that, uh, that Elizabeth talked about, mm -hmm. because it turned out that, that, that the, the, the central philosophical conservative argument was the new natural law argument that argued that marriage is impossible between same-sex couples uh, because same-sex couples cannot have intercourse or coitus 
which is the sexual act oriented towards uh, the, the procreation of new children. But the argument was kind of astonishingly, it's not sort of children that need marriage, it's, it's the children making sex that makes sense of the norms of marriage, according to these conservative arguments. Now, these conservative arguments were made in academic journals uh, and so on, ne never really in the courts. They, they didn't uh, register there because they're awfully hard to figure out. I, I could go through the argument uh, that, that I won't, though maybe I'll offer one, one uh, quotation from it. Uh, Sharif Georges, Ryan Anderson, and my colleague Robbie George, uh, in a, a book called What is Marriage that was cited by Justice Alito in his dissent uh, in the Windsor case, uh, say this, only a man and a woman can marry because marriage is a union whose norms and obligations are decisively shaped by its essential dynamism towards children. But crucially, that dynamism comes not from the actual or expected presence of children, which same, same, some same-sex partners and even co cohabiting brothers could have, and some opposite sex, co sex couples lack, some opposite sex couples lack, but rather from the way that marriage is sealed or consummated in coitus, which is organic bodily union. So I guess I say that the argument was that it's the baby making sex, not the babies, that makes sense of marital norms of two-ness, monogamy, permanence, and exclusivity. In any case, I'm, I'm gonna skip over that argument. There are other conservatives argument that were made about the channeling function of marriage, but uh, Justice Posner uh, offered a rather uh, ripping defense, uh, sort of critique of it in, 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 a, in a federal court opinion that we could talk about, uh, and uh, uh, arguments about how same-sex marriage might hurt children uh, and so on uh, were, were also uh, put aside uh, on obvious grounds. Uh, marriage has been regarded as a fundamental right under our Constitution and its extension to same-sex couples seems to me uh, 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 an advance for constitutional for and, and, and uh, basic justice. And we can come back to the conservative arguments if you want. Uh, as I say, the one argument that they have advanced for decades has been this slippery slope argument, and, and I will talk about that, in part because it resonates much more widely uh, uh, and, and raises lots of serious issues about why marriage is a civil institution uh, in a liberal democracy and why monogamy, which is something we've simply never really thought about, uh, at least I hadn't, uh, and, and I think there's, uh, few of us have. So critics of marriage uh, then uh, coming from uh, the left and, and, and the middle. You know, the middle includes people like Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler in their book Nudge, who argue for the privatization of marriage. There are a wide variety of criticisms of marriage as such, as a civil institution. Many of these critics focus on issues of numbers, as I said, and seek to open marriage to more than two spouses. Uh, some advocates for more radical marriage reform are, are willing to accept that polygamy will likely take the form it's traditionally taken of one husband with mul multiple wives, but others argue that we have no reason to expect plural marriage of the future to resemble polygamy of the past. And so many, including Elizabeth Brake, who's a very interesting philosopher, Sonu Betty also, and, and, and others, including 120 law professors plus and intellectuals who signed a statement called Beyond Marriage, expect that plural marriage would take the form of polyamory or egalitarian group marriage. Um, yet other critics of marriage focus not so much on numbers, but on a long line of feminist thinkers who say that marriage itself is a poor vehicle for recognizing and supporting the basic need we all have for caring and caregiving relationships. The need for care in its many forms is the most basic and inclusive good at stake here, and marriage is an under-inclusive and unfair vehicle for recognizing and supporting the good of care. So that yields various proposals. Elizabeth Brake would retain the word marriage, this is the most provocative and kind of interesting, but I think also not very plausible suggestion. But anyway, she would retain the word marriage in law, but reconstitute it on a much broader basis to include caring and caregiving relationships of all sorts, of any number, any combination of genders, without regard to reciprocity, romantic love, or sex. She argues that individuals should be able to pull apart various aspects of marriage, the caregiving part, the sharing a household part, the powers of attorney, uh, the sharing your bank account, if that's what you want to do, raising children together. You should be able to do this with multiple people, not put all your eggs in one basket, as she, as she says, but, but have multiple relationships that, that parcel out aspects of marriage with different people and call them all marriages. Uh, so that's, as I say, the most creative proposal, uh, and it's cited frequently by the conservative uh, advocates of the slippery slope because they say, you know, here's evidence of what, what's to follow from chaos that's meant to follow from same-sex marriage. There are other proposals. Tamara Metz and others uh, uh, have, have argued for a substitute label of caring and caregiving relationships that the state would recognize and support. Tamara wants to call them intimate caregiving unions, and there are other proposals as well. 
Now, other critics of marriage focus on what they see as the special status of marriage, that the word marriage has a lot of resonance in our culture. It carries a lot of freight. And the law of marriage gives weight to that, recognition to that. And it gives a kind of unfair honorific to couples that settle down in this kind of relationship. And they would say we should substitute something like civil unions or domestic partnership as the universal legal title uh, and leave the word marriage to churches, perhaps. Sunstein and Thaler argued this. They argued it about 10 years ago when, when the controversy was more intense. They thought it would kind of drain the cultural wars of some of their weight. But they also thought that it would allow people to personalize their marriages more. You know, why have marriage as a kind of off-the-shelf arrangement that people don't personalize and, and, and design to suit themselves? Uh, so that's one other uh, uh, critique that people advance of the institution of marriage as it exists, that it tends to be an off-the-shelf arrangement that people sort of take without thinking through the details and personalizing it to suit their own preferences. A one-size-fits-all model makes no sense here in a diverse liberal society. So there are many proposals, many criticisms. One thing that many of them share is the judgment that the normative resonance and cultural power of civil marriage illegitimately constrains freedom and diversity. Marriage entwines law, politics, centuries of cultural understandings, religious meanings, social norms, so as to impart a deep and distinctive shape to people's self-understandings, their plans and their aspirations. And that can't be legitimate in a liberal democracy. And yet it seems to me the case for monogamous marriage is, is sound and turned precisely on its capacity to shape our deepest aspirations, ethical judgments, religious convictions, uh, to secure equal liberty and fair opportunity for all. It's legitimate, it seems to me, for the liberal state to facilitate people's pursuit of good lives so long as it does so fairly. And moreover, it behooves the liberal state to secure a stable regime of equal liberty and it's on that basis, I think, that liberals, broadly speaking, should support the preservation of monogamous marriage, for reasons I'll, I'll explain. So um, uh, I'm going to begin by saying a few words about the problematic special status of marriage, the idea of marriage as, it, as it's sometimes described as a kind of honorific. I don't think that's the point of the, of the word marriage and its, 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 uh, its public meaning. So I'll say a few words about that, and then I'll say even more briefly about the various legal aspects and, and incidents of marriage uh, and, and uh, how these things make sense and can be defended from the standpoint of uh, public interests. And then I'll go on and say a few words about monogamy. All right, to anticipate my conclusions, the status aspect of marriage, its meaning and resonance in our culture, actually serves specific and defensible functions. And the various legal incidents of marriage, the rights and obligations of married couples, are all subject to ongoing negotiation. We should do more to support all children and all parents and all adults, but we can do that while preserving marriage. And finally, everything we know about polygamy or plural marriage suggests that we're well off having left it behind and that monogamy supports basic constitutional values of equality, liberty, and fair opportunity. All right, so to start with the two broad aspects of civil marriage that have been the subject of controversy as problematically special, are first the symbolic dimension of the word marriage. And secondly, the various legal incidents or aspects that are the particular rights and obligations of married couples. So starting with a symbolic or expressive dimension, I defend a common sense understanding of marriage as it's come to exist in America over the last 40 years. I take its core to be the public declaration of two people who commit in public to loving and caring for one another over a lifetime, to building a life in common together. This is the core of the marriage vows to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, so that's what's part. We can all say those words. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and those are some variation on that are still used as the marriage vows, though there are lots of creative variations. Now, notwithstanding a divorce rate that hovers a bit over 40%, marriage is still a presumptively permanent commitment of two people to build a life in common together, to stick together through life's trials, to work at, at sticking together for life's trials, even if, even if everyone knows that, that it may not work out. It's, it's, it's the commitment to trying to make it work, I think, that's, that's part of what it's about. Now, one obvious response will be to say, well, what about love? Surely marriage at its core is an emotional bond based on love. And I certainly don't want to discount that. But couples nowadays generally fall in love, have sexual relations, and cohabit before marrying. So the emotional bond is already there without the marriage. Publicly declared commitment to building a life in common seems to me crucial. Uh, and it's also something that's emphasized, as a matter of fact, in very many uh, self-help books about marriage. Now, no other status has the same social meaning. 
domestic partnerships, civil unions, and other options have comparatively unclear meanings and implications. And that's been recognized by litigants in the marriage cases. For Kristen Perry, one of the lead plaintiffs in California Proposition 8 litigation, marriage provided a language to describe her relationship with her partner. And I quote, I'm a 45-year-old woman. I've been in love with a woman for 10 years, and I don't have a word to tell anyone about that. Marriage would be a way to tell our friends, our family, our society, our community, our parents, and each other that this is a lifetime commitment. We're not girlfriends, we're not partners, we're married. So marriage itself is very public, as well as a personal commitment. Once people know you're married, all sorts of presumptions follow. A train of generally understood legal entitlements and responsibilities. Hospital visitation rights, a right to information from doctors, decision-making authority in the, in the event of incapacitation, a right to jointly control property, social invitations will naturally include both spouses, and so on. Now, if marriage has a reasonably well-understood public meaning, what's added by the law of marriage? And here I draw, uh, draw on a valuable article by Rafe Wedgwood. The existence of the legal form of marriage facilitates the fulfillment of people's serious desire to get married and be married as a matter of common knowledge. The law of marriage helps make the relationship of civil marriage socially legible, not just to members of my church or subgroup, but across my whole society. And this social legibility has been recognized by people on both sides of the same-sex marriage debate by John Finnis, the natural lawyer, and by Andrew Sullivan, both of whom recognize the value of a clear, common symbol of commitment. Publicly committing to marriage furnishes a way for a couple to signal their commitment to one another and to make it known to others. The commitments of marriage once entered into become social expectations and bases for normative judgment the opportunity to undertake a commitment to assume certain constraints and bear certain obligations while also enjoying a variety of benefits, including greater mutual assurance that comes with the assumption of marital bonds, is a valuable option and therefore freedom enhancing as long as the decision to marry is freely undertaken. And that furnishes a ground, I think, for making sure that not too many basic social welfare benefits turn on marital status, such as health benefits partly to ensure that people are able to leave a marriage if they're not happy with it. Now, some say that the idea of marital commitment is becoming increasingly passe, given a high divorce rate and a declining percentage of adults who are married. And it's true that Americans are choosing cohabitation over marriage in larger numbers, and a smaller portion of American adults are currently married than in the past. But among Americans over 25 years old, 80% either are or have been married, and more than half of the rest want to be married. The divorce rate has declined since its peak in the early 1990s, especially among the college educated, among whom marriage has become much more robust. And marital norms remain powerful. 82% of Americans say that adultery is always wrong in 2004, and that's up from 70% in 1973. So the marriage option is not only valued, but it's valuable. The same benefits of marriage to heterosexual couples uh, and their children are also available to homosexual couples. Numerous studies show that people in reasonably happy marriages have better physical and psychological health, lower mortality rates, and increased longevity compared to single people. The benefits of marriage seem to be especially great, indeed very much concentrated, as a matter of fact, for men. Uh, uh, and these benefits flow to them as well as to society. The benefits flow overwhelming to men, in fact. <laughs> uh, but we need it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, they've also flowed to society in the form of lower rates of violence, drug and alcohol abuse and crime committed by men. Uh, uh, Same-sex couples and their children benefit in, in particular from the ways that legal recognition of their marriages reduces social stigma and psychological stress. The suicide rate just came out last week, I think, among gay teenagers has declined. Post-same-sex marriage declined quite considerably. So since the Windsor and Obergefell decisions, same-sex couples have been marrying in, in, at a very high rate. Uh, there were, uh, in 2013, only 21% of same-sex couples were married. Uh, in five months after Obergefell, there were 100,000 same-sex marriages, and it's now nearly 50% of same-sex couples are married. So quite a large increase in a short amount of time. So same-sex marriage has been good for marriage in that respect. All right, so that's all I want to say about the status aspect of marriage. It serves straightforward public and private purposes. It allows people to enter into a reasonably well-defined and widely understood form of commitment as a matter of common knowledge. This is something very many people want to do, 
and it serves their interests as well as the interests of society. Fairness requires doing more to assist the unmarried, and it certainly requires greater efforts to provide the economic opportunities that many unmarried couples regard as a prerequisite to marriage. Uh, 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 and we should do other things like promote greater gender equality in marriage, more equal childcare and housework, uh, and so on, so that marriage it, it becomes a better deal for women than it is now. Uh, 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 but it seems to me that uh, marriage is well worth supporting, in part because of the benefits to spouses, in part because they want to do it, and in part because of the benefits to children and also to society. All right, even more briefly, the second large aspect of marriage, which is the legal incidence of marriage, the various rights and obligations defined in part by 1,100 different federal laws, but also mainly at the state level. So very complicated. I'm just going to mention that there are three broad functions of these various specific rights and obligations, responsibilities that are specific to marriage. One is to help support couples' emotional bonds. Uh, various rights recognize that one's spouse is one's most trusted confidant, the person best placed in general to understand and act on behalf of one's interests. So special immigration privileges for spouses and family members, for example, the testimonial privilege in court, surrogate decision making, those all kind of recognize and reinforce and support the particular emotional bonds and connect connections that go with marriage. A second broad set of entitlements and obligations recognizes that spouses are likely to be economically interdependent on one another. Uh, likely to share a household, uh, cooperate in paid and unpaid work, uh, and recognizes their joint relation to the state with things like family sick leave and so on. Now, one thing that's very important to realize is that marriage doesn't only bring special benefits, but also special constraints and obligations and responsibilities and expectations. Spouses generally enjoy what are called homestead rights and protections that limit one spouse's uh, ability to throw the other out of the joint household. Uh, they can't, spouse can't deny the other spouse support or maintenance, and likewise a fair share of marital property in the event of death or divorce. So there are limitations on what spouses can do. And these help protect spouses against vulnerabilities that come with marital commitments and the pooling of resources. Married couples filing federal income taxes may pay a higher rate of taxes because it's generally regarded that they can economize by sharing a household. So that also makes it fairer to the unmarried. A third and final category of benefits and obligations uh, associated with marriage concerns parenting. In general, parental rights and obligations don't depend on being married, but marriage still makes it easier for couples to adopt jointly. Uh, uh, and, in, and as I said, in other respects, there's no question that children tend to benefit uh, uh, from being raised by two married parents. I think that, that's true. Some of it's the economics that come with it, and some of that could be addressed by, by greater public provision of support for single mothers, no question. But there's also greater emotional support uh, that comes from uh, being raised by, by two children. So it's not only a matter of economics. Now, one thing that features, uh, one thing that's important to recognize here is that these features of contemporary marriage are extremely, have been extremely well suited to same sex couples for decades. The reason being that marriage was remade by the feminist revolution and gender equality in marriage. Uh, the, the, at least formally speaking, the rights and privileges of the spouses are equal under law. And it's only on those terms that same-sex couples ever would have found marriage attractive. So marriage was remade by the feminist revolution, the gen gender equality uh, in the 60s and especially 70s and into the 80s. And, and that made marriage well-suited to uh, same-sex couples. In fact, same-sex marriage further entrenches the norm of spousal equality in marriage. And that's one reason why many conservatives have opposed it, one reason why feminists have tended to be in support of same-sex marriage. Uh, uh, and a second very general point is that the special benefits and burdens, responsibilities of marriage seem reasonably well balanced and appropriate for married couples given the kind of commitment that they undertake. Make a distinctively comprehensive and open-ended commitment to care for each other in sickness and health and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think if marriage were only a matter of receiving benefits and not being assigned special responsibilities, uh, even more people would marry. But it does carry both these responsibilities as well as various benefits. At the same time, many of the traditional legal incidents of marriage ought to be made available to persons in other non-marital caring and caregiving relationships. I think the critics of marriage are right in that respect. We should do more to support and recognize caring and caregiving relationships that people want to enter into that are good for them. That, 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 that turn out to benefit from them. Uh, and this is already well underway. People are using contractual relations to allocate legal powers often associated with marriage to persons other than spouses, including powers of attorney, hospital visitation rights, next of kin privileges. Uh, 
And of course, as marriage critics argue, we should do more to recognize and support uh, th those in, caring, in, in caregiving relationships that are not marital, marital to support single mothers and so on. But we should do all that without eliminating civil marriage because civil marriage is distinctive and valuable. Uh, we don't have to, to eliminate civil marriage in order to recognize and support these other non-marital caring and caregiving relationships. I would not join Elizabeth Brake in designating all of these caring relationships as marriages. If a grandmother and grandson want to share a household, pool their resources, exchange care of various sorts, responsibilities, and perhaps enjoy some privileges as well, good. But it would be a positive disincentive to call that a marriage. Nobody wants to marry their grandmother. Uh, and, and public recognition and support for marriage is not an excuse likewise for, for not supporting all children and all parents. Uh, uh, but we can, we can do all of that while continuing to recognize and support marriage. And then finally, just this, uh, the last thing I'm going to say about the civil aspect of marriage, marriage is a civil institution. What about the proposals of people like Thaler and Sunstein that we should shift from marriage as a kind of predefined status relationship, a one-size-fits-all, you know, as they say, to more personalized uh, relationship? Well, uh, there are pluses and minuses. And, and look, you can already do that to a great extent because people can enter into prenuptial agreements quite readily. But very few people do in their first marriage. They, they do more often in their second and third marriages. I'm sure, I'm sure Donald Trump has. Uh, uh, but, and it's usually when there's a richer spouse who wants to protect assets from a first marriage. Not always. There are, there are certainly legitimate reasons for prenups to protect children's interests from a prior marriage or a prior spouse and so on. So there are reasons. But the thing about, about greater personalization and a more contractual model, which is what Thaler and Sunstein support is, you know, contracts invite bargaining, and bargaining uh, often disadvantages the weaker party. Uh, the benefits of a status relationship whose broad terms are defined in advance by law may be quite important to protect the weaker and less calculating party. And judges overseeing divorce settlements help to ensure that some measure of equity in the division of marital assets. It's also extremely valuable to have a, a set of default rules uh, defined in law that have been found useful by married couples in the past. It's very hard for young couples to anticipate all of the things that may happen under the blinding force of romantic love, especially. So, so having a package of default rules can be very practically uh, useful. And as I said, uh, while people can enter into prenups, rather few do in their first marriage, I think it's about 3%. There are states that have other alternatives to marriage available. Uh, covenant marriages in Arkansas, one or two other places that retain fault-based divorce and make it harder to divorce and have mandatory counseling before divorce and remarriage. In those states where it was thought this would help to beef up marital norms, um, Mike Huckabee entered into one of these. Only about 1% of people take advantage of these. So, so in fact, the, uh, the standard form seems to suit most people's interests. And it's actually very flexible. Married couples can live all sorts of different lives. They're not required to live together. They're not required to pool their resources. Uh, they can have open marriages and so on and so forth. So marriage is actually, I think, distinctive, but also quite flexible. Uh, all right. So I've said something about the two large dimensions of marriage, the symbolic or the expressive dimension and the various legal incidents. Uh, 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 and uh, as I said, I think the symbolic dimension serves a practical function. It allows people to declare to themselves and to others a distinctive form of commitment, and that declaration itself strengthens the commitment uh, and, and is part of what people want in being married. This has been articulated very nicely by couples in the same-sex marriage litigation. And likewise, these rights and responsibilities and so on seem reasonably well designed. Uh, no doubt aspects of these rights and responsibilities should be uh, reformed. They're on, subject to ongoing reform and revision, and, and that's, that's absolutely fine. But given how many millions of people have built their lives around the marital commitment, it seems altogether appropriate to me that change here should take place slowly and incrementally as it indeed is happening. Uh, and as I said, marriage is not only valued but valuable. Children generally do better with two married parents uh, so long as there's not a great deal of open conflict. And uh, what, what's very striking is, uh, is that marriage is actually now quite strong among those couples who get a college degree. Uh, uh, those who are well situated to succeed economically are waiting until their late 20s to marry. Uh, they're delaying marriage. They're starting a career first, often having graduate degrees. They're not postponing sex necessarily, but they're postponing children until after they're married. And those marriages are both more egalitarian and more stable. The divorce rates at this point look like the, the divorce rates of marriages back in the mid-60s. So, so marriage is actually doing very well among the well-educated, those who are situated economically to succeed in the economy, among those with high school degrees, 
or high school dropouts, it's much weaker, partly because uh, they have more traditional expectations about the marital role, want the husband to be the breadwinner. Sometimes this is, this is a greater tendency. And, and with the decline of factory work and so on, that's often not uh, something that they can support. So they're, they're tending to uh, cohabit rather than marry and have children in a cohabiting relationships which prove much, le much less stable. And this points to a widening class gap in the future, uh, unfortunately. Robert Putnam and others have written about this. So it seems to me that marriage is valuable and we should actually do, be doing more to make it more widely available, uh, including through economic measures. Now, I'm gonna conclude uh, br quickly here, but I wanna say a few words about monogamy. It's one of the most, I, I think that was the part of the book I found most interesting to work on. Because uh, it's just not a very widely examined question. Uh, and the argument that I want to make against polygamy concerns its effects on the well-being of individuals and families and the larger society when institutionalized as a social form. So my argument is not moralistic. I'm not arguing that there's anything inherently immoral about it. I'm arguing as a social form, it tends to uh, have malign consequences. Uh, uh, in its known form across human history. It's structurally unequal and prone to domination, conflict, and unfairness. My argument is, so my argument is moral but not moralistic. When I say monogamy, I mean marrying one spouse. Two people pledging to build a life in common together. The terms of that common life I want to emphasize are up to them. If they want to have a sexually open relationship, that's their business. It may be a bad idea, it may be a mistake, but I think it's their mistake to make. Uh, marriage should be about two people building a life in common together, and it's, it's, it's up to them to decide on the terms of that uh, relationship. Plural, so plural marriage is what I'm against, not sexual freedom. And the positive basis, the principal basis here, I think, is the fundamental positive duty of government to secure equal liberty and the fair opportunity to flourish for all. And I should emphasize, too, I'm not in favor of criminalizing uh, polygamy or plural relationships. I'm just not in favor of equal recognition of them. So normative polygamy has been extremely common across human history. In 85% of the societies studied by anthropologists, it's the preferred form of marriage for the most wealthy and powerful males. All emperors and emperor-like men, as was said in Imperial China, where it's estimated that you know, around 10% of the males may have practiced polygamy, or more precisely, polygony, one husband with multiple wives. Polygony is still extensively practiced in Africa, the Muslim world, and now as before, it's associated with gender, economic, and social hierarchies among higher and lower status males, as well as between men and women. Polygamy as polygony can serve very valuable social functions. In desperately poor regions of Africa and elsewhere, women may find it more advantageous to be the second or third wife of a relatively well-off farmer than the sole spouse of a destitute husband. Polyandry, marriages with multiple husbands, is extremely rare. It seems typically or always to be the result of dire poverty, such as a short, shortage of arable land. A small family farm may be unable to support more than one family, and so two brothers may share or actually own, uh, in many of the places where it's practiced, a single wife. This is the case in some poor Tibetan regions in southern China and Nepal, even now. Controlling male jealousy in such marriages is extremely difficult. So it seems to me it's telling that whereas polygyny has the, the one husband with multiple wives is often an exalted status to which the most successful males aspire. Polyandrous marital arrangements seem to be the consequence of, of desperate circumstances, in any case, are quite rare. Now, what do we make of that fact? Is it, is it uh, partly, no doubt, a matter of historical contingency? Uh, the prevalence of male domination and patriarchy in the past, for sure. But evolutionary anthropologists and psychologists frequently argue that the observed pattern reflects men's and women's differing evolved psychologies. Men tend to be more attracted to multiple sexual partners, and male jealousy tends to be uh, apparently harder to control. I mention this only for what it's worth. We could follow up. Lawrence may know more about this from his work on evolution. But Joseph Henrik, a leading evolutionary anthropologist who provided excellent testimony in the polygamy case in Canada a few years ago, argues, and I quote, that legalizing all forms of polygamy will principally result in an in in increase in polygonous marriages by wealthy, prestigious men. Nothing of what we know about our species evolved psychology or from the anthropological record indicates that either polyandry or forms of group marriage will spread beyond trivial frequencies. That's, that's Henrik. And in fact, that's consistent with what we observe. Considerable evidence suggests that polygamous families, as we know them in history, 
are far more, and, and societies, polygamous societies, are far more prone to various forms of conflict and inequality as compared to monogamous ones. These were really well summarized in the British Columbia reference case on polygamy, which was decided in 2011, December 2011. A really important resource because the judge in that case uh, spent a year basically surveying what's known about polygamy uh, from leading ex expert academics. The chairman of the Stanford Classics Department assembled evidence on the origins of monogamy. Uh, uh, Ruth McDermott, a comparativist at Brown, uh, assembled evidence from her own work and but from many others about the effects of polygamy in societies on health and educational outcomes among children and, and women. Uh, and Joseph Henrich su summarized the, argue, the evidence from evolutionary uh, science uh, of, of various kinds. And a historian uh, of ethics at Emory, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, talked about the ethical background. So it's a really 100,000 word opinion basically summarizing what's known about polygamy as a social form from multiple academic disciplines. And it was on that basis that he made the decision that, uh, that in that case, in the Canadian case, they upheld the criminal prohibition, relatively liberal Canada. With support of most feminist groups in Canada, by the way, <laughs> upheld the criminal prohibition. I'm not in favor of criminalization. I'm in favor, I think there it tends to be symbolic in any case, but I'm in favor of, of, of not having equal recognition. His, the argument being that the spread of uh, polygamy beyond uh, its, its very low frequencies now would, would, uh, would uh, create a, 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 a reasonable risk of harm to society. So let me just summarize very briefly. Within families, polygyny tends to cr create intense jealousies and conflict among plural wives and children sharing a household. It lowers the average relatedness within families, and that's associated with much greater violence in the home. Indeed, the Koran warns you cannot be equitable in a polygamous relationship no matter how hard you try. So the main effect of the Koran was to limit the number of, of polygamous marriages which had been uh, allowed more frequently uh, uh, prior to that. Polygamy tends to reduce the attention and resources that each child receives. It allows male heads of household to invest their surplus resources in securing additional wives, leaving fewer resources for nurturing and educating rising generations. In comparison, monogamy increases the surplus resources available to be invested in children, contributing to happier, healthier children and greater social progress. One surprising finding from the experience of 19th century Mormon polygamy is that the children of lower status males actually had better health outcomes, lower morbidity rates than the children of higher status males. The reason being that the higher status males were able to wed more frequently, father more children, reducing the care and attention devoted to each child taken individually. Polygyny also increases intersexual competition among men. It allows high status males to acquire multiple wives numerous offspring, but in doing so, it deprives lower status males of anything like a fair chance to find a spouse. And unmarried males do what unmarried males do. They drink too much, they fight too much, and so on, uh, uh, they have, or have a tendency to do so. As people that live in college towns may have observed. <laughs> uh, 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 just, just kidding, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in fact, rates of violence do increase uh, uh, in a strong way. Rose McDermott, the, the, the comparativist from Brown, uh, who summarized the evidence across socially says, polygyny's negative effects, and I'm quoting her, are wide ranging, statistically demonstrated, and independently verified using a variety of analytic tools. So just one other point on this. The origins of monogamy are not entirely well understood, but they're in Greece before the historical period. Uh, uh, normative uh, monogamy, which limited all men, including the most powerful and the wealthiest, to one legal wife at a time, seems to have contributed to more cooperative social relations and greater success among the Greek city-states. It was copied by the Roman Republic. Uh, later, Western and then other societies copied these more successful social patterns. So monogamy spread with the influence of Rome and later Christianity, so its origins are Western but not Christian. The Western origins of monogamy suggest to some that it's a Christian and colonial imposition on non-Western cultures. But it was Mao Zedong who imposed monogamy in China. Kemal Ataturk outlawed polygamy as part of his modernizing efforts in Turkey in 1926. Japan did so uh, earlier on its own, though with, I think, some pressure from Christian missionaries. Uh, polygamy was banned in India's post-independence constitution for Hindus, though it was accommodated among Muslims. So we live in an interconnected world and should consider the impact of our decisions on the burgeoning global culture of human rights, especially women's and children's rights. And so let me put it this way. Nowhere that women are equal is there any widespread social movement in favor of plural marriage. 
and where, where, where plural marriage exists, but women are becoming empowered, polygamy is viewed as an important obstacle to women's equality. The transition to institutionalized monogamy is associated with more egalitarian social relations, less inequality between men and women, reduced social conflict, higher investment in children, and greater social progress. Uh, these are all very important goods. They're the most fundamental goods uh, that, that we care about in thinking about distributive justice. So while there are liberty interests involved, if someone wants to have a second or third spouse, uh, it seems to me that what we need to do is to secure a regime which establishes the foundations for equal liberty and fair equality of opportunity, and that's what monogamy does. We should mon regard monogamy and Rawls in terms of part of the basic structure of society and as, as, as partly underpinning uh, liberal justice. Now, there are several categories of principled considerations I'm just going to mention briefly in closing, and these help to support the case against polygamy. Uh, in terms of equal recognition. One, preferences for polygamy are not equivalent to same-sex orientations. We know that a large class of people, not a huge class, but a substantial class, are oriented towards falling in love with someone of the same sex. I don't think people are oriented in the same way to only falling in love with two or three people at a time. A preference for a plural relationship is something that, that, that seems to be quite plastic across societies and seems to partly be a function of the kind of social norms that exist in society. Secondly, uh, the two-ness of marriage makes sense given the kind of commitment that marriage is as an egalitarian relationship of two spouses, sharing a life in common together uh, that allows for an equal and reciprocal commitment of two people to each other. Bring in a third person and uh, it's a recipe for conflict, for, for, for two against one in all sorts of circumstances, and this is what the historical record seems to show. And then the third consideration in, in favor of one spouse per person uh, let me put it this way, let me add something to that point about conflict. The Mormons confined polygamy to the elect because they thought it required special virtue to manage. And in fact, they didn't think it should be practiced outside the Mormon community because non-Mormons wouldn't have sufficient virtue to practice it. Uh, 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 so uh, so th that also supports it. A third consideration in, furnace, uh, in favor of one spouse per person is distributive fairness. Marriage is a great good sought by the vast majority of people. We should secure the conditions within which this opportunity is available to all on fair terms. Now, Andrew March of Yale has jokingly likened this argument for limiting everyone to one spouse as uh, similar to the Lockean proviso limiting property acquisition in the state of nature, we must leave enough and as good in common for others. Uh, uh, it's a funny remark. Yet the evidence supports the notion that plural marriage tends to take the form of polygamy, disadvantaging low status males in the marriage market. Monogamy furnishes a social basis for the fair distribution of the opportunities for family life. Finally, and just in, in concluding, what about polyamory, the, f the egalitarian form of group marriage? Well, tellingly, there's very little evidence available about it. There's not a single empirical study of polyamory. All there is is anecdote, speculation, uh, and uh, uh, blogging. Uh, um, there's no, we have no reliable social evidence about it at all. Uh, there's no society in the world that I'm aware of in which there's any widespread social movement in the form of plural marriage, uh, including the Netherlands and so on. Now there are people blogging about it and there are books written about it for sure. Uh, but uh, 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 it, it, we don't have enough knowledge to, uh, it seems to me, create law for something of this sort. It's also the case that while marriage is a two-person relationship, the legal structures are extremely well suited to same-sex couples because of gender equality. Three or four-person marriages are going to be quite different. They're going to require very different property rules. There are going to be different rules about uh, child uh, care and so on and so forth. There have to be limits on immigration rights. It's going to raise a whole bunch of set of issues that we have that would have to be dealt with separately. Now, I could say that um, the, uh, Elizabeth Brake, for example, who advocates for polyamorous rights and others, has various bits and pieces of evidence, but. Uh, it's very scattered. She, she cites, as many people do, a, a law review article by Elizabeth Emmons called Monogamy's Law, which has been cited quite a lot. Uh, but Emmons has you know, like four cases of plural couples there. Once that was on the Jerry Springer show. Uh, others appeared in court records. You know, somebody slept with somebody and so on and so forth. And then she also talks about this book by Ethan Waters called Urban Tribes, which was a, a yuppie ethnography written in San Francisco in the 1990s. And it was, you know, sort of like friends. It was a bunch of post-college -grad post graduates living together. They all came from well-off backgrounds in a household in San Francisco. And she slept with him, and he slept with the other one, and so on and so on and so forth. 
and he, he called it urban tribes, and she argues that it's a harbinger of some new form of family life, urban tribalism, she calls it. Well, Ethan Waters, the author of that book, is now married with children. Uh, it was a stage of life, uh, you know, of, of people in their late 20s, early 30s, uh, with college degrees, you know, taking a while to settle down, as, as people in their, their, their 20s with college degrees tend to do nowadays, which is fine. Uh, but there's no evidence there that, um, of any uh, uh, new form uh, of family life that's a substitute for monogamous marriage. So I just say wait. Uh, uh, it seems to me the most liberal thing to do is not presume the form of law that would be appropriate to these sorts of relationships should they come to exist as a stable social form, but wait till they exist uh, and, then, and then create law for them should they exist as, as stable egalitarian relationships, which would be something utterly new in history, as I say. There had never in any society, anywhere in the world, has there ever been an egalitarian form of plural marriage. So, uh, so I think we should wait and see. Uh, in any case, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Steve. And now I want to invite um, some uh, comments from first Lawrence Thomas and then um, from Tom Keck. OK, so I get up now. Do I go over there? Uh, you can. I You're can right, stay here? So you don't have to. I'll go over here. OK, okay just for the moment. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, I want to suggest that uh, the evolution of biology does suggest that I'm, I'm inspired by Aristotle. And Aristotle introduced the idea of perfect friendships. And perfect friendships are very rare, but unbelievably rich and unbelievably wonderful. And what I want to suggest that evolution, uh, male and female marriages take the idea of perfect friendships to a, a second level. And part of the reason why it does so is because in addition to all the intimacy that's involved, there's, a, there's a, often the possibility of bringing children into the world. And that's a gift like none other that one gives to oneself as well as to others. And so the gift that I want to think that we have as individuals growing up is to have the self-knowledge to participate in that kind of marriage. What distinguishes, and I think, I, I like, I'm sorry, there is, what I like about his argument is that where with perfect friendships in Aristotle's account, we accepted men or two men as equal, two women as equal, and for the first time, we're now at that point in the history of the world where we are accepting women as full-fledged equals, and that's a respect that men are showing for women that even in our modernity is just beginning to take off and have the kind of depth and security that it should have. Amongst my students, for instance, it's very clear now that there's a kind of acceptance of the equality of women vis-a-vis uh, -vis men. And so I think what we will be moving forward to where that trust, that is characteristic of perfect friendships that Aristotle had in mind, is now on the verge of being characteristic of romantic ties between two people, men and women, woman and a man, because in the very way we now understand and we've come to have the acceptance of that as equals. Furthermore, there's the issue of bringing children into the world. And there is that asymmetry that's not at all trivial. That is to say, the only people who bring a, woman into, a child into the world is a woman. And the respect for that is something that's becoming very rich and very powerful and very significant, where when I look at the history of the world, it seems to me men did not fail to respect that. I've often wondered why, and I've often thought jealousy. Now, why do I say that? Because that's a contribution to the society and to the world in which we live that is absolutely extraordinary, bringing a child into the world. And being able to bring that life into the world is a moral power, as far as I can tell, that has no equal. Men have had to learn how to live with that. And the move I want to make goes something like this. What we are doing, I think, in the, in the, in the fullness of time is accepting, just as Aristotle thought they could be perfect friendships, what he thought, male-male, female-female, what I think modernity has done with a kind of significant and extraordinary is accepting the idea that perfect friendships can include a woman and a male. And what is more, that perfect friendship exhibits an excellence that only a woman and a male can exhibit. And then you introduce the, the level of trust in a particularly fascinating way, because when that woman becomes pregnant, the trust that that male can give to her is without equal. And there is no other relationship 
between woman and woman and woman, or male and male, that is as characteristic of the depth of that trust. And what I think about human beings generally, when we put ourselves in a position where we voluntarily participate in the trust of another, that's a gift that's ever so majestic, ever so powerful, and ever so significant. And we're now at the point, I think, as we're moving into society and moving forward and appreciating what I think has happened, if I look at the history of human beings, is that men have not always appreciated that. And one might ask a question that goes something like this. Might it be that men have been more jealous than they might have been? Because that power to bring a child into a human being, to bring a life into this world, while a man contrib contributes to that, it is out of the body of that woman that that child comes. And thus what you get is a male having a kind of respect and gratitude for that contribution to the world that is like none other. So I think we're moving now, as I look at my students, I see them having an appreciation for one another, males having an appreciation for women, which is not just about having sex with them, that wasn't like that when I got here in 1989. So I think there's a contribution, a moral progress that we're making that captures, reflects very nicely what the changes that have come about. But we've needed the kind of information about our biological makeup and our psychological makeup, and that information now seems to be quite explicit, quite real, and irrefutable. Absolutely irrefutable. A final comment, I think I get five minutes, is that right? Okay, a final comment would be this. Human beings are complicated in all sorts of interesting ways. And while something can be true from the fact that it's true, it doesn't follow that we accept it. Part of the gift that we give to ourselves as we move forward is accepting those are ever so rich and ever so complicated and ever so sophisticated truths. They're bringing that child into the world has two things going for it that are very fascinating. One is trust on the part of the male that that child is his child. And the other is trust on the part of the woman that that male will take responsibility for that child. And that is trust like none other. I conclude with one last comment about perfect friendships. <coughs> By definition, perfect friendships are what? Voluntary. You can't put a gun to someone and say, damn you, you're going to be my perfect friend. Dash, dash, dash. No. Insofar as the two people, Alpha and Beta, become perfect friends, it is that each sees in the other an excellence that's so powerful and so significant and so encouraging. And when we see that in people, when two people see that in one another, that's a way of joining together, appreciating one another, and coming together in doing so. And that's rare. Modern technology, modern society makes us much more complicated than we were before. But we're now moving to the point that we appreciate and understand those complexities in a way that we didn't before. And with that understanding, there's a moral progress that we're making that would have been incomprehensible a mere 50 years ago. I think I've done my five minutes. I will stop. Um, thanks, Steve, for the fascinating talk, and Elizabeth uh, for the invitation, and all of you for still being here, except the ones of you who are leaving right now. Um, <laughs> um, and I should probably say, by way of preface, Lawrence actually did pretty good, but like giving a professor a microphone and saying you can talk for five minutes is like, I, don't, I was trying to think what that's like, giving an elephant like a barrel of peanuts and saying you can eat one of them. It, no matter how many times you say it, it's not going to work. Um, so I will do my best. I, we'd, I know we want to get to Q&A, um, but the talk is fascinating. I've got a lot of interesting um, things oh, to yeah, say. So, awesome. um, so, uh, so it, it, Steve didn't dwell on this here um, in the talk. Um, but it, the written version of the argument, his rejection of slippery slope, slope arguments in the marriage equality context focuses at length on the case of adult incest, um, uh, which, again, he didn't talk about this here, but I think that's where he's on strongest ground. Um, uh, here, he focused on the issues of polyamory and plural marriage, which seemed to me to be harder. So maybe it's good that he focused on those ones, because um, that gives me something to say. Um, there have always been uh, people gay, straight, and bisexual, who have entered into long-term consensual, romantic, and or sexual, and or parenting relationships involving more than two people. Um, 
when Steve uh, turns his attention to these relationships, uh, he is, I think, on weaker footing um, than, than, than with the case of adult incest. Um, he acknowledges that state recognition of such plural relationships uh, may be warranted and that such recognition might, it, might provide important protections for vulnerable parties within such relationships. He just doesn't want it to be equal recognition with monogamous marriages. Um, and he provides a number of arguments from law and philosophy to justify this unequal treatment. Um, we can each decide on, their own, on our own how persuasive we find them. I encourage everyone to read the book um, and to engage in some conversation here and outside uh, when we're done. Um, for myself, I was left not fully convinced. Um, uh, Steve provides, a, a, I guess I would say, a parade of horribles uh, regarding the global history of polygamy. <laughs> Um, but it would not be hard to tell a similarly horrible history of monogamous marriage, which until quite recently served principally as a vehicle for male control of women's bodies and women's property. Um, in neither case does the horrible history help that much, I think, in evaluating efforts by folks today to build more consensual and more egalitarian family structures. Moreover, Steve's history of polygamy implies that the longstanding effort to abolish it reflects a modernizing push toward universal human rights. I don't think that's right, or at least I don't think, I think it's incomplete. Um, in the US case with which I'm familiar, the 19th, cent the 19th century effort to stamp out polygamy reflected religious bigotry directed toward Mormons far more than any demands for gender equality, of which there were not very many um, by prominent uh, actors at the time. Um, so, so I just encourage folks to read, read, the, read that argument and, and think, think it through for yourself. The main point I want to emphasize in my five minutes or whatever I've left um, is, is, a, is a slightly different one. Um, the main point I want to emphasize is that whether or not you find Steve's legal and philosophical case, philosophical case against the slippery slope argument persuasive, um, the case won't really settle the matter, right? Whether or not it's persuasive. Because slippery slope arguments operate at least as much on the terrain of political mobilization as on that of law and philosophy. Um, in law and philosophy, slippery slope arguments are easily dismissed as misleading. Judicial decision making is all about line drawing. Uh, so the fact that we allow or prohibit one thing doesn't necessarily mean that we have to allow or prohibit another similar thing. Um, such distinctions are routine in the law and, and perhaps also in philosophy. Um, but while they may be legally routine, um, they are sometimes politically complicated, right? I'd like to give you, um, I, I'm gonna say two examples if I can squeeze them both into my remaining time. Maybe I'll stop with one, um, but I have two examples. Um, so first, um, all constitutional democracies existing in the world today protect the freedom of expression, uh, but most of them make an exception for racist hate speech. Uh, many worthy arguments have been advanced in support of this exception. Uh, but once you say that your legislature is free to ban speech that incites hatred against racial minorities, you're likely to face similar calls to allow bans on, say, anti-Semitic speech. Uh, Jews are a religious rather than racial group, um, but also an ethnic group. And the long history of anti-Semitism uh, uh, will understandably lead many Jews to call for similar protections from hateful speech once they've been extended to somebody else. Um, once hate speech bans are extended to anti-Semitic speech, there's likely to be political pressure to extend them to Islamophobic speech and homophobic speech and speech that mocks people with disabilities and the like. If legislatures and courts accede to these demands, they will impose ever more restrictions on free expression. But if they don't accede to these demands, then they'll be widely perceived as imposing illegitimate double standards. This is the situation that the European Court of Human Rights finds itself in at the moment. Um, it has repeatedly held that European states can punish Holocaust denial, uh, but it held last year that they cannot punish Armenian genocide denial because that would unduly inhibit free expression. I've read the opinion, it's quite long. There's a lot of arguments in there. There might be plausible justifications in law or philosophy for that distinction, but there's no plausible political justification, by which I mean there is no way to defend this distinction without signaling to Europeans of Armenian descent that their claims on the state are less worthy than others. So if I have time, one more quick example, which brings us back uh, in the direction of our main subject of marriage equality. So when the US Supreme Court created the modern right to privacy um, in cases like Poe versus Ullman and Griswold versus Connecticut in the 1960s, uh, Justice Harlan on the court emphasized that these cases were about the private sexual relations of a straight married couple in their own home, and that the principle of privacy at issue certainly did not extend to, quote, adultery, homosexuality, fornication, or incest. He didn't think it extended to abortion either. Um, but once recognized, 
constitutional principles are not so easily cabined. Not because reasonable distinctions can't be drawn in law and philosophy, but because groups who see the rights of others being protected are likely to demand similar protection for themselves. The right to privacy that Harlan created for straight married couples in Poe and Griswold was subsequently extended to unmarried heterosexuals, to women seeking abortions, and then to gays and lesbians. Um, I'm confident that practitioners of egalitarian forms of polyamory have been watching these developments and will demand that their own rights be protected as well. I have no idea whether they will succeed or not. I don't know whether they will succeed in developing as large and potent of a political movement as LGBT marriage equality advocates did. But it's the answer to that question, not the abstract persuasiveness of the legal distinctions, that will determine whether marriage law expands to incorporate their claims. Thank you. You actually did it. Was it? <laughs> so, See? Yeah. I, uh, only if I apologize in advance will I succeed in doing it. Yeah. It was well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have time now for um, responses, questions. Uh, we just want to remind you we've got two people with mics, I think two. Uh, and um, so please wait for the microphone to come to you. And I see um, we have a question here to start with. If people could identify themselves. I'll... Okay, yes, so... Name, um, height, and weight. <laughs> please identify yourself before your question. Hi, I'm Carol Faulkner. I'm a historian. Um, so I'm interested in... You made a lot of arguments for low-status men and marriage. What about low-status women in marriage, and polygamy especially? And so to get back to the Mormon example, right, many Mormon women in the 19th century would argue... Utah was the first, one of the first two states to give the vote to women. Polygamy actually benefited women because it shared labor for childcare, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of my questions. Oh, well, and then there's a flip side too, which is when President George W. Bush wanted to uh, propose further welfare reforms, marriage was the answer to welfare, right? So there was a coercive aspect to potentially forcing marriage on low status women. And then the other question, which I'm sure you've thought a lot about, is the issue of marriage and social conformity. Um, so just your thoughts on those. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the low status women is probably uh, uh, something, for the, the Bush welfare reform stuff and so on, I, I don't favor at all. I mean, Linda McLean's work I draw on uh, quite a lot. And uh, I think we should have universal benefits for mothers and children and not uh, uh, pressure people into marriages uh, uh, to get support for children and and uh, and, and for themselves. So I'm, I'm I'm against that. In fact, I'm think universal provision is a kind of condition of the good of marriage, which is it being a voluntary commitment to two people to build a life in common together. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be using it as a substitute for the welfare state. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, you know, if I had to choose between favoring marriage and favoring a Swedish welfare state, I would take the Swedish welfare state, but that's not the choice. And, and uh, not having marriage is not going to get us a Swedish welfare state. So, but, but, uh, but, but I, think, I think something like that could be a precondition of actually having good, good marriages. Um, uh, in the, uh, look, so uh, I'm not going to argue with you about the, the, the Mormon women in the 19th century so much. Uh, in Africa now, where, where polygamy exists, Women's groups overwhelmingly oppose it. The African Union has come out to regard monogamy as a requirement of, of human rights and further equality for women. So where it's practiced now, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think, is a very good case for it. The Mormon case is, 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 a, is a tougher one for the reasons you've indicated. Uh, and, and indeed, women had rights uh, in, in Mormon communities that, 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 they did, that they didn't have now. There was the stuff I mentioned about the mortality rates and conflict, and I think some of that, I don't know how good the empirical evidence is there. I mentioned it, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on it. So as a general matter, uh, uh, it seems to me the social form r remains malign, and, and uh, as, a, as a general matter, though not in every, I, I, and I don't think you know polygamous families are necessarily bad. The, the the litigation that has gone on post gay marriage involving polygamy has been the sister wives case. 
uh, the, the TV show, uh, which is on TLC, I guess, uh, who are fundamentalist uh, uh, Mormons, but, but rather progressive fundamentalist Mormons. Uh, uh, it, it's a traditional form, uh, hub and spoke marriage with one husband and multiple wives. But as I understand it, he married his first three wives first, and then they all started having children at the same time, and they're all roughly the same age. So it, it, it doesn't involve great age discrepancies and so on. And they're on TV every week. Uh, uh, so, uh, but many, because you know, they seem like a perfectly, perfectly okay, okay couple. They are, they do represent the traditional form. And he did decide to have a first wife in the first episode, sorry, a fourth wife, excuse me, in the first episode without consulting the other wives. Uh, he, he, he presented to me, actually he proposed to the fourth wife. So, uh, uh, you know, but but I'm not you know I'm not arguing this is a terrible thing they get they share the household and so on and a lot of the times the TV polygamous families the big love families of course that was that was fictional that was based on some real cases you know they were rather well off they had their own homes and so on and and I think in the sister wives case the wives have product lines and so on that are partly advertised with the TV show anyway there there there, there are better and worse cases but but I'm arguing about the general form and uh, uh, I think if we were to leave, if we were to to have equal now when I say equal recognition, I'm not in favor of equal marriage rights for, uh, for polygamous families, as I say, and I think if we did have that, it could be, it, it, they, they, the effects would all, not all be negative. It might encourage some of the fundamentalist families to come out of you know, hiding and so on, though these people have a TV show, so they're not exactly in hiding. Uh, and there haven't been any prosecutions you know, for polygamy that haven't involved child sex and so on, so... Uh, uh, you know, in decades, so I don't know how much hiding is going on, but, but I, I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's a, I don't I don't think it's the world I, I don't think it's I don't I don't think the, I I know I have I, I I have some reservations about the case myself. As a general matter, I think if we legalized it, encouraged it, we would we would encourage a greater polygamy and great, great more open polygamy among more among Muslim immigrants, uh, and and we might. Uh, encourage more uh, among Mormons. I don't know if the, if the norms would change within their communities. But as I look at it across the world as an historical matter, it seems to me a good thing that we've moved towards monogamy and it's generally gone along with, with, uh, with, with greater gender equality and, 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 be and better social relations. But I, I admit that there are gonna be examples. Now let me say one other thing, which is some courts have recognized uh, three, three, you know, third parent rights. Uh, Typically, not in plural marriages, but where a lesbian couple, for instance, has a sperm donor, and they want the the, the man to be involved, and he wants to be involved, and sharing third person rights, you know, if if it, if it works well, and they all want it, and so on and so forth, it's fine. I have no problem with that. That's not a marriage. That's not a three person marriage, but it's recognizing a third a third a third uh, you know partner's parenting rights. So it so it involves something of the sort. You know, I'm totally flexible here. Obviously, it can involve some conflicts if if the lesbian couple decides they want to move away and, and you know, I don't know what the what, what limitations they'd be imposing on themselves. We'd have to think about how it, how it works out in practice. But I'm, I'm um, uh, pragmatic or, or open-minded when it comes to legal developments in this area. But it seems to me the general case with respect to, to, um, uh, to, to, to polygamy is, 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 is a negative one. Uh, 19th century, it's true, that wasn't, a lot of it wasn't about gender equality, but they didn't emphasize patriarchy, even in the Reynolds case. Um, I mean, there were other aspects there too, but, but, but the Reynolds case uh, did emphasize patriarchy along with, with other things. Um. Um, I think Deborah had her hand up first. Thank you. Nice to see you, Steve. Like Deborah one. Pillow, Anthropology. Um, I'm not speaking as somebody who's an Americanist, but since you brought in all of these studies that have been done around the world, I find myself in sort of a weird position as a feminist um, defending polygyny um, in its place. Um, I, I think you're correct that we're talking about unequal relationships. But I work in Africa. All of the groups that I've worked with are polygynous. And um, I think that it's very important that any institution be seen within its cultural context. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's never been contextual in the United States or in the Western, you know, in, in this part of the world. I think to say that the AU and all of these other groups in Africa condemn it, um, you know, there are now um, these laws in places like Uganda that if you practice 
um, same sex relationships, you will be shot in front of by a firing squad. This did this is not from Uganda. These are ideas that are have been brought by by these newfangled fundamentalists, these massive churches that are coming to these different countries. Um, and I think that it, while I understand why the feminist groups throughout Africa might be arguing in favor of monogamy, you're talking about Western educated, largely women. Um, these, so, so what I know of polygyny is not that women have equal rights, but that there are rules um, in order to make sure that conflict is lessened as much as possible for one thing. And I have, I have no reason to believe that children in fact suffer. And I've seen cohorts of children who are brought up together, rather. Um, and if the father has the wherewithal to feed them, then all of them are fine. Um, but it's, it's also not normative to take several wives if you cannot support them. Right. And I and I and I so I think I think I think it's really important. I'm, it, again, I'm not defending polygyny. It's not it's not an institution I like. Many as the man I said, I thought he was nuts for having three wives, but um, I think you have to see it in its context. And yeah. I don't think it's contextual here. It just isn't, um, even in the 19th century. Right. You know, and I think that that really makes makes a big difference. I don't think that it. And to say that an evolutionary anthropologist, for example. I mean, that's by any other term, it's a sociobiologist. That's a very, very different way of looking at society. It really is, well, than if you're a cultural anthropologist. Yeah. Oh, but Henrik does field work and so on, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so it, it, there's a, there are a couple of interesting pieces. Sarah Song uh, at Berkeley has a chapter on polygamy uh, in, uh, in her book. And one of the things, she talks about the South African legal arrangements because it was recognized for uh, traditional people, not for whites, but uh, right. on account of traditional tri tribal traditions and so on under the South African Constitution. It also requires that, so there's a safeguard, a special safeguard built in, at least in, in law, which is that if, if they take a second wife, if a husband wants to take a second wife, he has to enter into a legal agreement with his first wife to divide property at that point, and it's supposed to be overseen by a judge. Uh, so it's a kind of partial divorce. Uh, with the first wife, uh, almost, um, which is protective. And I, that, that seems perfectly reasonable. And I, by the way, I'm totally in favor. People have to work these things out for themselves. I'm not in favor of, you know, American. They have to work things out. The fact that those women are, are Western educated, that doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but, 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 they, but they should work it out in their own communities. Yeah. Well, lots of ideas come from lots of different places. Sure. And uh, sure. I'm uh, just talking I mean, about uh, when, India when... adopted, again, its post independence constitution. And, and Ataturk, sure, modernizing, took some Western ideas. But we shouldn't think Western ideas are only work in the West. Uh, they, they, I mean, it, but but people need to adopt them, and embrace them in their own in their own places and in their own way, for sure. Uh, so this, but my understanding of this legal arrangement in South Africa in practice just doesn't work. Uh, they don't go to the judge. They don't get the agreement. And they do take a sec. They do take a sec. They do take additional wives. So, it, it, uh, the way I look at it are two things. It's acknowledging that there's a special problem there that needs to be addressed specially, right. and it seems to me a very reasonable way to address it. You know, formally speaking. But my understanding is that it, that it doesn't. It, it's not working very well in practice. But that also only works if they marry by civil law to the first. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Ex exactly. I think that's exactly the problem. And by the way, the one point about. Again, I, my, 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 my feminist friends, and, and Linda McLean's a good friend of mine, and she, she has got a wonderful response on this than I do. I mean, marriage has changed radically in, in the United States and in Western societies. Coverture and so on, it was radically an egalitarian before. It's a radically different institution now in legal terms. So, so of course, marriage did have this, monogamous marriage did have this past, but it's changed, it's changed remarkably. Maybe the same thing will happen with, 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 with plural. We'll see. Um, uh, yes, Glenn Morgan, Political Science Department. Um, in your case against uh, polygamy, you really relied upon consequentialist arguments. Yeah. And you painted a very rich picture of the bad consequences. But what would you say then to a, uh, a quasi-libertarian response to say that this is a right and regardless of the bad consequences, it ought to be a, uh, yeah. a practice that should be allowed? Yeah. Well, I'm not in favor of criminalization. So, so a libertarian would probably would make two kinds of arguments. One would be for, 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 for legal license, which, which I allow. And second would probably be to get rid of marriage as a civil institution, maybe just a contractual regime. 
uh, libertarians, I mean, the, the, the Sunstein Thaler book, the Nudge book, uh, you know, is, what is it called, Progressive Libertarianism or something like that? I forget what the subtitle is, but, but they want to, to develop choice architecture and, uh, uh, so, so, but libertarians tend to be, I mean, Rand Paul, after the uh, Obergefell decision suggested, what a number of libertarians suggested in the past, that, that now is maybe time to get rid of civil marriage as, as, a, as a marriage as a civil institution, leave it to churches, adopt something else. It's, that's never been picked up. And, and, but, but it seems to me, Glenn, that, uh, that, that, that what progressive liberals are about is not just you know, negative liberty, leaving people free to do things, but securing the underpinnings of equal freedom. Uh, and fair equality of opportunity, uh, and, uh, and to secure those underpinnings, not just to leave them to the market and so on. So I think in a, in a, in a, in a, it makes, makes kind of me kind of interesting is that you can make the case for monogamy from the standpoint of liberal justice, not just public policy. Now, I think it is consequential in part because, uh, you know, I, I think with lots of institutions, I have a feeling you'll agree that, you know, the way we define rights to free speech and so on, you know, partly is about the consequences they tend to generate in the world. And, and we regard lots of things as human rights and so on, probably because we, we, we believe on good grounds that these are things governments tend to interfere with. Uh, uh, you know, so they're, they're designed to target certain characteristic interferences and head them off. And, and, and that obviously is re reflecting certain you know, concerns about consequences. So, so I think when it comes to this kind of institution, we need to secure equal liberty. We need to think about whether the, the, the right to have a third or fourth spouse ought to be regarded as one of the equal basic liberties, as Rawls would put it, that we can secure equally for all. I just think that, 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 that our historical experience suggests it's not an opportunity we could secure for everybody. It would tend to be the sort of thing that would, that would be uh, hoarded by wealthy high status males and that would be productive of greater inequality. Um, and, and I, by the way, I, you know, I don't think this is a consequential argument. Somebody said something earlier, this book is not going to settle this. Of course not. But, but I actually think there's something in, I mean, we have, we have I mean, one of the things that I never thought about monogamy, it, it is an important sort of structuring aspect of our lives and our aspirations, and, and it's worth thinking about what, what the case for it is. Um, I mean, uh, Tom didn't mention in the paper I have this discussion of, of, of adult incest, which is also a matter of choice. There, there's another libertarian. If you have two adult siblings, who have grown up, who are not going to have children together, uh, uh, but want to settle down in a romantic relationship, what's, what's the argument against that? Now there I do favor continued criminalization, though not active enforcement. The, the, the reason being this, uh, it seems to me that there's a reasonable ground for worrying that that, would prospe that prospective possibility would undermine the norms uh, that prohibit re sexual relations in the family that are extremely important to protecting the interests of children. And that you couldn't have adult siblings having sexual relationships without that affecting the way we think about the relationships of, of siblings. Uh, now, I can't prove that, <laughs> but it seems to me a sufficient ground to, to think that there's a reasonable ground for, for having that prohibition. And that the liberty interests involved in having sexual relationships with your, with, with your adult siblings, it's just not a very significant liberty interest, even though there is a liberty interest there. So I, I think we have to you know, think about how, to, how do we conduct a system of liberties that we can secure for all and that are consistent with basic social institutions that, 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 are, that are very important in our lives. So that's how I think about it. I think we have time for one more question. I know um, a bunch of us probably do, but um, maybe we can give Eric, Eric the, the last question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, God, okay. I was switching into my, my yelling voice in here. Um, so I'm Eric, I'm a political science student, maybe political scientist. Um, so you're, in discussing liberty interests in the, in the construction of the different legal regimes behind particularly same-sex marriage and particularly undergirding those, one of the, if we shift back from the Windsor and Obergefell moment and instead look at the uh, liberty interest that's identified in Lawrence versus Texas, which is twofold and could be cited, one in the dignity of the individuals, but also in the ability of individuals to make a choice to partner and have that level of intimacy. Um, then it reframes this, and Lawrence itself does this, it rejects the logic of Bowers and said it is not about the sexual interest. So there's no legal discussion really about the sexual choice to have a right to partnership with 
a sibling or anything like that, but instead it's about the site of choice of partner. Um, and so a legal regime that was built upon that site of two, three, four people choosing to engage in an intimate relationship, it doesn't become about the, the right to have a second or third or fourth spouse. It becomes about the right to have a relationship based upon choice and intimacy recognized. And so when you ground it, uh, so I just wonder how you would respond to an argument, something like that, uh, to turn this into a question. Uh, in terms of it becomes about that, the, the self-definition of intimacy that can be recognized in multiple forms rather than the kind of yeah. marriage in the monogamous sense. Right. I don't think all of our re relationships need to be recognized. Uh, and marriage is a distinctive form of recognition. It, 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 it recognizes a commitment, I think, uh, a, a distinctive form of commitment. It's a declaration. It's associated with these normative uh, values. And it's, so, it's, so it's distinctive. And uh, uh, we don't have all of our relationships recognized. I'm not sure that sexual relationships or cohabiting relationships, I mean, many people choose to cohabit and don't want to enter into a mar marriage relationship. Now, I, I've, I've given you the reason. So, for, and first of all, there's clearly a, a, a permission to enter into uh, to these relationships. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, that that, that that's fine. Um, but um, we just don't have any evidence of an egalitarian, committed form of plural relationship. We just don't. Uh, now, again, I mean, it's striking to me, and you know, the Netherlands and so on and so forth. I mean, there are many very progressive places in the world: San Francisco, you know, Boston, Syracuse. I mean, there are lots of places where you know where, where people could be. now you know there's stigma against things and so on and so forth. I I I I, I agree with that. But let's see it. Let's see it develop first before we. And again, marriage is not just about recognition. It's about recognition of a commitment, and the public recognition strengthens it by, by, by attaching reputational costs to those who, who violate the terms of marriage. Now, I would say this, is that I really think that it's up to couples to make the, the terms of relationship themselves. So there's one issue in the law which uh, has to do with consensual non-monogamy agreements in uh, the, the places where a couple has decided to have an open relationship, and, uh, and then there's been a divorce later on. Um, uh, in some cases, the judges take that kind of thing into account in, in, in settling the property. I think even with no-fault divorce, it sometimes can make a difference. And uh, it's been argued that, well, we entered into an agreement to have this non monogamous And the, the couple of cases, the judges have refused to recognize that as against public policy. So I, I would say that we should, we should I mean, we should, if, if couple wants to enter into such an agreement, it seems to me that should be cognizable in law, and that the law shouldn't be deciding that a marriage, two people living together, have to involve sexual exclusivity. It's up to them. So, so I really do mean that, that it should be up to the couple, but, I, but it's because I don't, I don't see any, I don't see <laughs> sufficient evidence of these plural relationships being egalitarian in form that we shouldn't write there, because we do have plenty of evidence about the ones that are in egalitarian in form. And, and we would get more of those. I worry, frankly, that in the era of rising inequality, the traditional form of polygamy could, could make sense to people. Uh, uh, in China, where uh, there are more plural marriages occurring because of great inequality or against the law, but the Chinese meant by the tens of thousands, apparently, I mean, this is what I, I don't have good evidence on this, but by the thousands anyway, have second wives in California often because they want the children to be American citizens, but they set, they set up Ernai, I think it's called. They have sex second wives. It, it, so it tends to take the traditional form. And in some other place, too, in Indonesia and so on, Afghanistan, where, the, where inequality has, you know, gone, the prestigious males uh, are, are, are engaged. So I, I don't think it's beyond the pale. You know, the Don, Newt Gingrich proposed an open marriage to his second wife before he divorced her. Uh, it seems to me that arrogant, wealthy males, uh, you know, that it's not inconceivable that even in our more egalitarian era that, that we couldn't get you know, some resurgence of this. And so I, I, uh, I, I do worry about um, uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, that if we were to have plural marriages, they might well tend to resemble the ones that we've seen. That, that's my concern. Okay, now is the time when we take this conversation outside and we let our speaker have something to eat and something to drink. But please join me in thanking Professor Macedo.